Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center here at the library, the host of this event. In the words of its charter, the Kluge Center was created, quote, to reinvigorate the interconnection between thought and action through conversations and meetings with members of Congress, their staffs, and the broader policy-making community in order to bridge the divide <clears throat> between knowledge and power. On a day-to-day -day basis, this means that we at Kluge support scholars doing innovative and specialized work, and we project scholarly work to a broader audience in events like today's. The library has had, as most of you know, a book festival for going on 20 years. It, it happens on a single day, Labor Day weekend. But the book festival now is a year-long event for the first time this year. And uh, this fall, in our NBF Presents, National Book Festival Presents series, we had, among others, Neil Patrick Harris drawing an overflow crowd in here on his children, children's books, Brad Meltzer, Karen Armstrong, Andre Asiman on his new book, and others. We are looking forward to the announcement of the 2020 lineup for this program. Today we are highlighting 100 years of women voting with a program that dovetails with the Shall Not Be Denied exhibit here at the library that commemorates the ratification of the 19th Amendment. I hope you'll take the time to visit it after the program. It remains open until 6.30 or 7 p.m. tonight for people attending this, this program. Tonight we have Christina Wolbrecht. She has literally written the book on the subject with the forthcoming, she's in the middle, in case you can't tell who is laughing, A Century of Votes for Women, American Elections Since Suffrage, co-authored with Kevin Corder. She's also the author of Counting Women's Ballots, Female Voters from Suffrage Up Through the New Deal. She's the director of the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy at Notre Dame University, where she is on the political science faculty. Jane Jun, immediately to my left, is professor of political science at the University of Southern California and a leading authority on political participation and public opinion. She's the author of several books and dozens of articles, including The Politics of Belonging, Race, Immigration, and Public Opinion. She is currently at work on a book on the gender gap and voting in the United States. Our panel moderator, Colleen Shogan, is assistant deputy librarian for collections and services at the Library of Congress. She is the Librarian of Congress's designee on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and serves as Vice Chair of the Commission. Please join me in welcoming Colleen, Christina, and Jane. Thanks, John. I think we're going to have a terrific conversation this afternoon, and we will be taking questions after our conversation, so save them up, and we'll have microphones roving around uh, so you can participate in the conversation. I'd like to start out with a, a basic but fundamental question to both of you. Should we be using the terms female voter or women's voting, or is there something inherently problematic with those terms? We're going to be too nice to each other, I think, this whole afternoon. Oh, don't count on it. <laughs> uh, so it's a great question and a great place to start. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that all of us who look at women voters and look at the way that women voters have been talked about politically and by candidates in the press over time is to recognize that on the one hand, there are certain patterns we can see among women. Women were... Uh, excluded from the franchise as women. They were enfranchised as women. So there's a good reason to keep gender sort of front and center. You can do that and still acknowledge that women are as diverse and um, different as men are, um, as we would absolutely expect. And so um, it has almost always, always been the case, for example, that any differences between women voters on average and men voters on average are far and away swamped by differences uh, between racial groups, on the basis of education, et cetera. Um, at the same time, we know that across racial uh, groups, there's a gender gap. So I think to really understand women as voters, we need to sort of see women as all the other identities and, and interests that they have. Great question. And I think we should use terms like women's vote and female voter. And that goes to the basic difference between men and women and how much power they have in society. 
and I, we were just talking about this in the green room before, and if you are a woman and you are traveling to a city, as I did last night, do you think about what time you will arrive and whether or not you can take the subway or whether or not you have to take a cab? Where is your hotel? Can you walk in the dark? You think about that, right, as a woman, right? It's for, foremost in your mind about where you can be and what you can do. And that is because we are constrained in a fundamentally different way than men are as a function of the consistency and the omnipresence of patriarchy in society. It remains so despite a hundred years of suffrage. Now having said that, it is because of that, it's one of the reasons why we can use the term women's vote or female voter because it's a con it is a distinction with political consequences. It's useful. But at the same time, I think we have to be very mindful about using data wisely that we do have. First, we don't want to jump to conclusions just because somebody is female or male. Second, we need to recognize the heterogeneity in the population. And all that to say there's the heterogeneity and variation inside the category of woman itself. We talked about this also. How many of you are mothers? Let me see mothers, right? But you're in a very different, you wouldn't be here at four o'clock if you were the mother of toddlers. Probably not. It's much more difficult for you to be here as a mother of a toddler versus the mother of a high school age student or an empty nester. So even, even within the category, there's heterogeneity. I think we also can talk about women voters, but we need to think dynamically. Being a woman voter today is very different than it was in 1964. We need to understand context, and we need to o account for overlapping traits. The three most important are inequality's unholy trinity, race, gender, and class. And I think if we do those things, when we talk about women voters, it's a good place to start. Okay, great. We're going to go through the entire century. We're going to start at the beginning uh, with the amendment. Uh, settle in, everybody. Yes, yeah, settle in. Uh, with the enactment of the in amendment in 1920. So women have been demanding the right to vote for over 70 years, uh, but finally the amendment becomes part of the Constitution in 1920. Why does it happen in 1920? Well, believe it or not, 100 years later, uh, this is something we're still sort of talking about. Um, you know, for women to vote was to sort of upend and uh, sort of not just the, the sort of everyday act of walking into a ballot place and you know filling out a little form sort of thing, but but really exp assumptions about what femininity and masculinity are and what politics is. Politics was absolutely understood as a masculine endeavor in the same way that caring and parenting, mothering is understood as a, as a feminine endeavor. And so the, the blocks against this were real. There's reasons why it took generations. A lot of things were happening in the 20th century. You have sort of a worldwide movement uh, to expand suffrage, partly as a way to, to sort of shut off um, other sorts of rebellions. We'd rather extend the vote to other classes of people, for example, than, than risk revolution, as was seen as a threat. Um, it's because women served and uh, uh, played so many important roles in World War I. Uh, it's because uh, a number of Western states had enfranchised women and the world had not collapsed. Children were still fed, um, homes were still cleaned. Um, so it really took a confluence of, 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 of context. But the other thing to say is it took the very hard, very careful work of women activists. Right, and that's everyone from uh, the national organizations that push these sort of national campaigns, um, to the work of the protesters outside the White House who were arrested and um, uh, force-fed, um, all of these different forms of activism in lots of different ways to put that sort of pressure on. It's always a puzzle. Why would people in power ever give more power away? Why would they ever expand the electorate beyond the people that elected them? Um, it's almost more surprising that it ever happens than, than anything else. Let's talk about the first election after the amendment. So this is the 1920 election. It's only about 10 weeks after the amendment becomes part of, of the Constitution. Uh, what was turnout amongst women in that election? And tell us uh, in non-technical or non-political science terms how you were able to make those estimates for 1920, given the fact that there's no public opinion polls and no exit polling in 1920. 
So this is a real problem. You would think it's been 100 years. Don't we know how the first women uh, voters cast their ballots? But of course, we don't put pink and blue ballots into ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually, in some ways, we kind of did during this period. But I was told to not be technical and go on forever. So I will try not to do that. Um, and so, as Colleen just said, there's no reliable public opinion polls from this period with very few um, exceptions. And so we really have relied on sort of supposition, assumption, et cetera, for 100 years. When I started, when Kevin and I started the project, the earlier book, just on looking at the 20s and 30s, people would say to me, well, why are you studying that? We know that. And what I would always say is, we think we know that. We're very confident that women didn't turn out to vote, et cetera, but we don't actually know that. So my really quick non-technical explanation will be that we were able to take census data that tells you how many people of voting age live in pretty small places, counties, or sometimes even subdivision of counties. And then we were able to take election records from those same places and use a, um, a methodological advancement that had really only happened in the last 20 years in the field of ecological inference to infer the turnout rates of men and women in those places and then at the state level. Now you might think, well that sounds fancy, why should I believe your estimates, which I'm gonna show you in just a second. Uh, and the answer is that there is an exception to my blue, my pink and blue um, example, which is Illinois enfranchised women in 1912, so uh, for elections from 1913 on, um, but only for a subset of elections. This was not actually that rare. Um, I got to see the women's suffrage exhibit at the National Archives today. They have a patent for a male and female ballot box, so women would go in one way and men would go in another, because in a number of states they were enfranchised early, but not for all offices. Illinois is the only state in the union that counted men and women's ballots separately from 1913 until 1920. And so what we do is we sort of estimate what we think happened in Illinois. It turns out to look almost exactly like what actually did happen. So we can compare our estimates to the real thing. And that gave us enough confidence to sort of look at um, a number of, of states. So we looked at 10 states. If there's no question, all of our, every piece of evidence, including ours, is that women turned out to vote at lower rates than men did in the first elections after suffrage. The beliefs about the proper role of women that um, had backed up women's disenfranchisement did not immediately end, they did not immediately go away. Um, and so that was a big part of the puzzle. It gets, though, a little bit more complicated when you look at the level of the states. And so what we found is huge variation. Women were literally 50 points more likely to turn out to vote in some states than in others. You will be shocked to hear that in places like Virginia, very few women, white or black, turned out to vote in 1920. Um, this was an uncompetitive state dominated by the Democratic Party that had poll taxes and literacy tests and general sort of anti-democratic features. Women in Missouri and Kentucky, more than half of those women turned out to vote in the first election after they were enfranchised. So this is turnout in those ten, in a sample of states from 1920 to 1936, men are in the yellow, women are in the purple because I like purple better. Um, you know, so they're gonna slowly sort of close this gap over time. Um, so this is showing, again, men in yellow, women in purple. Women's turnout in 1920, um, across a range of states. So Virginia is that one at the very, very low. Kentucky and Missouri are very, very high. So what makes Virginia, Massachusetts, Connecticut, places where very few women turn out to vote, different than Missouri and Kentucky? So I would emphasize two things in particular. <clears throat> One is Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut were very uncompetitive. Everyone knew the outcome of those elections. Virginia was completely Democratic. Massachusetts and Connecticut, completely Republican. Missouri and Kentucky were rare states in 1920. They were very competitive. The election, the presidential election in Kentucky came down to 0.05% of the vote in 1920. Um, it turns out when elections are really close, parties, candidates, neighbors, husbands, wives, encourage each other to turn out to vote, right? They, there's a reason. People see the value of their vote. So maybe it wasn't that women didn't want to vote. Maybe that in places that encourage their voting, they're more likely to turn out. The other difference for Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut is that they had lots of election laws. As I mentioned, poll taxes, literacy tests, et cetera. In Virginia, of course, to keep down African-American turnout, Massachusetts and Connecticut were 60% first or second generation immigrant in 1920, and we wanted to keep those voters out as well. Uh, and so very strict laws. None of that in Missouri and Kentucky. The last thing I'll say about 1920 is that women actually, despite the 19th Amendment, did not vote in four southern states. 
uh, as many states did during those periods, they had a six month registration requirement. You had to register six months in advance. Other states quickly passed laws, had special registration days for men and women. Um, four southern states said, oh, we're sorry, you missed your chance. We'll see you in 1924. Okay. So was this viewed as a disappointment? So the answer is yes. Um, someone said to me once when I showed this slide that this could have been uh, Twitter hot takes in 1923 and 1924. Um, and I'm very proud. These are headlines from everything from Good Housekeeping uh, to the Washington Post. Um, almost immediately, conventional wisdom was, well, we told you. They didn't want to do it anyway. Women's suffrage was completely a failure. Um, and it was not just uh, the press that thought this. This is an article by two sociologists in 1924 based on that Illinois data I just told you about, one state uh, where women's turnout had been pretty slow. And the title of that article pretty much tells you all you need to know, women's ineffective use of the vote. They basically did not turn out to vote, and when they did, they voted like their husbands. Um, if you were to read any textbook from the 50s on, um, any account of women voters after suffrage, um, if we basically say most women didn't turn out, it really didn't, wasn't the revolution everyone expected. If you were to follow that back to who cited who to cited who, at some point you're going to come to this article. One article about one state and one election was the basis for our conventional wisdom as scholars about how the first women voted. As I hope I convinced you in the slide you saw briefly, um, looking at one state is almost certainly going to give you a warped view of how women actually did turn out to vote. How did some of this lower turnout in the 20s and 30s, how did that end up affecting generational turnout all the way up until about 1980? So we know that women who came of political age, um, who turned, it would have been 21 then, uh, at the time when women were still denied the right to vote, who were socialized into the idea that voting was not part of their civic obligation or their life, remain much less likely to turn out to vote throughout their lives. And that's going to dampen turnout um, across the 20th century. As you suggested, we're going to see sort of just a slow growth. Men's turnout's going to decline a little bit. Women's is going to go up um, until 1980. So 1980 is the first year in which a higher percentage of women turn out to vote than men. And that's been true since then. It's worth saying, however, that there are more adult women uh, in the American electorate. Uh, and so there's actually been more women voting in presidential elections since 1964. Okay. So what about uh, mid-century, the 40s and the 50s? Does tur the turnout gap narrow? And what about vote choice? Uh, how does that change? So what we saw in the United States and around the world um, was really that um, what, what scholars have actually called the traditional gender gap. Differences were not at all big between men and women in terms of who they voted for. So we start getting good surveys in the late 30s, mostly in the 40s and the 50s. And mostly scholars are not trying to explain why are women X or Y. They're trying to explain why do women and men really not vote that differently at all. And their explanation overwhelmingly, and this is both scholars um, uh, and the press, is that women just vote as their husbands tell them to vote. Their evidence for that is pretty limited. They basically look at the fact that men and women vote similarly and say, well, it must be because women vote as their husbands tell them to vote. I have a secret for you. I also vote as my husband votes. Um, you can draw your own inferences about how the direction of influence goes in our, in our family. Um, it turns out that we are very similar in lots of other ways that might be predictive of our vote, and that was probably also true 50 and 80 years ago. If you're a labor union household, if you're a Catholic household, if you're all these other sorts of things, probably you share a lot of interests that might shape your electoral ability. If anything, women were slightly more Republican. My favorite example is in 1960, there were all these stories about literally using these words, women swooning over John Kennedy, rushing, women in the clutch of middle age trying to touch John Kennedy. Women were actually slightly more likely to vote for Richard Nixon. After uh, civil rights legislation and the voting rights legislation in the 1960s, how does that affect turnout for women of color? into the 60s and into the 70s. Um, how does that affect uh, the turnout rates? Well, be, turnout can only happen if you're allowed to vote. Right. So, um, and it sounds ridiculous, but it is in fact the case that after 1964, with the vote, and 65 actually, with the Voting Rights Act, but it's also important to think about challenges to the Voting Rights Act throughout the United States history since that period. That includes not only, for example, the 
very significant case of South Carolina versus Katzenbach. It's 1966 where southern states, former slaveholding states, wanted to argue that the VRA was unconstitutional. That was, in fact, um, cons not considered to be so by the United States Supreme Court by a vote of nine to zero, including the vote of former Klansman Hugo Black himself. What this leads to, however, is not only an increase in the proportion of people who are then eligible to vote, so that is to say the denominator, but also increases in the, in the numerator, people who are turning out. It's important to recognize as well that in 1965, that was not the only important piece of legislation that Congress passed and the President signed. What else happens in 1965? An important piece of legislation, Professor Wolbrecht. I'm assuming you're talking about immigration law. That's right. The <laughs> Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, without that, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today, nor would many of the people in our country be here. Now, what happens in 65? The Congress decides to reduce the barriers or get rid of all of the ethnic and racial barriers that were up prior to this, so beginning in 1924 with the National Origins Act, even extending through the 1950s. So in 1952, that is the very first year that Asian Americans or Asian immigrants can become naturalized citizens and therefore be allowed to vote. Prior to that, Asians, in addition to African Americans, were not allowed to vote in the United States and Asians because they could not become naturalized citizens. So the other important thing, in addition to the Voting Rights Act and the CRA in the year before, is the Voting Rights Act, which is very much unexpected to have any impact. I believe the Congressional Research Service, probably doing research right here in the Library of Congress, argued that it would have no impact, that it would, there would be nothing. Because when members of Congress looked across to think about who would be coming to the United States then, they thought they would be reunifying families who would come to the United States after World War II. All those families who had been excluded, in particular Jews from Europe, as it turns out, that wasn't the case. Of course, people came from Europe, but many, many more people came to the United States from the Caribbean, from Latin America, and from Asia, creating a much more diverse voting landscape. It doesn't happen immediately, but it begins to open the door to immigration, which now results in a voting population in the United States that's almost fully one-third non-white. I'm going to just I want to explain the graph sure, real quick. Yeah. That the solid line is the percentage of the U.S. population that identifies as uh, racial and ethnic minorities. The um, purple dotted line is is percentage of the of basically of all women voters that are racial and ethnic minorities, and a percentage of all voting men who are racial and ethnic minorities. And what you basically see at the beginning is, of course, that because of Jim Crow and other sorts of practices. Uh, people of color are turning out at rates much smaller even than their representation in the, um, in the population. As their representation in the population increases, so do their voting rights. So you can see 1964 with this sort of, uh, sort of jump. I think the important thing to say, thinking about 2020, is that uh, it is now the case that women of color, uh, African American women specifically, uh, turn out at some of the highest rates of any racial and ethnic group um, in politics. Um, higher rates than white men, uh, and about the same rate as white women. So let's talk about 1980. Christina referred to 1980. Why is this really an important turning point for both turnout for women, but also for vote choice? So you remember that thing called the gender gap? Um, that is actually not a phrase that existed before 1980. I'm now sorry I didn't bring the graph. If you look at a Google engram of the use of words in books, there's no gender gap until after 1980. Um, a couple of important things happened in 1980. One is that for the first time, um, there seemed to be a statistically significant difference um, and a pretty significant one in the vote choice of women and men. This graph is showing the difference between men and women in both presidential vote choice in purple and party identification in yellow. One of the reasons that 1980 looked like such a big deal is that the gap in both of those things had actually declined in 1976. Do you see that sort of place where it falls down right before 1980? Think of who the candidates were in 1980 moderate Gerald Ford, moderate Jimmy Carter, right? This is sort of this last moment. And then uh, it's Carter and Reagan in 1980, and we get a fairly big gap. This also wasn't an accident. Um, that term gender gap was actually um, coined 
by feminist activists. The ERA was, was not getting passed. Ronald Reagan, who had uh, kicked the ERA out of the Republican platform in 1980, he had made the first strong uh, pro-choice um, uh, uh, platform statement in the Republican Party in 1980, feminist activists wanted to show that women voters mattered. So what they showed is that women voters were much more likely to vote, much more likely, 10 points more likely about, to vote for the Democratic candidate than were um, uh, male voters. Um, and so they really had an incentive to bring a lot of attention to that. And because those two things happened at the same time, the Republican Party changing on ERA and abortion, Democrats taking strong stances in favor of ERA and in a pro-choice direction, everyone assumed that's what caused the gender gap, right? The parties are dividing on women's rights issues, and they absolutely were, and now women are voting more Democratic than our men. And so this must be what's, what's sort of going on. Um, that remains um, a very powerful idea. Uh, I, usually bring up a Nate Silver uh, article talking about the role of abortion and the gender gap. Um, the reality is from the very beginning, um, there's been almost no evidence that it is women's issues like abortion and the Equal Rights Amendment that contribute to the, um, uh, the gender gap. Um, first of all, it's interesting that whenever there's a difference between women and men and, and women, we say, well, what is wrong with women? What did women do to cause this gender gap? Initially, most of the gender gap was actually caused by the behavior of men. Um, both, uh, this is showing party identification over time, men again in yellow, women in my preferred purple. Um, 1964 is this sort of height of Democratic Party identification, and we've known for a long time that Democratic identification falls off from 64 on. Um, it falls off really sharply among men. It falls off really sharply among Southern white men. So it's falling off amongst, uh, and why is that? Because great society programs, because of the civil rights revolution, because all of these things that are associated with the Democratic Party. And those two things go hand in hand. Social welfare and race become very entangled in the 1960s. And so while certainly over time, the causes of the gender gap vary, at least initially what was driving it was the, the sort of shift of white men in particular um, away from the Democratic Party. Women shifted too, but not nearly as much as uh, white men did. I'd like to offer a little corrective to that. And that is that the population is in fact changing here. So all these, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive phenomenon. What's happening by 1980, that's 15 years after the Immigration Nationality Act has gone into effect, which then welcomes individuals who come from a wide variety of racial and ethnic backgrounds as classified in the United States. In addition to that, African Americans and other minorities have now been allowed to vote for at least 15 years. So when you look at this graph, you might think that women are kind of staying as they are, but actually the category of woman is changing during this period. It's going from almost exclusively white to much more heavily, even though if not, certainly not by a majority, but well into double digits, non-white women. Non-white women are the thing that is driving, in addition to men leaving the Democratic Party, Non-white women are driving and pulling white women to look more democratic than they are and making that difference between which accounts for the gender gap and part of it. So let me ask you this. In 1984, which is usually identified as the year that the gender gap appears in its most consistent form, which is to say the gender gap being defined as the difference, the proportion or the, the percentage of difference between men and women in their support for a Democratic candidate or for a winning candidate. So you think that that would mean there's a gender gap in 84, and there is, it's not a huge one, and that in this year Reagan wins, and women vote more Democratic than they vote Republican. What do white women do in 1984? Do they vote majority Democratic or Republican? What about 1988? Democratic or Republican? White women? Republican. Republican. What about 1976? Uh, what about 1992? Uh, what about 1996? Or actually, 96 is not the year. What about 2000? What about 2004? What about 2008, 12, 16? Where do white women go those years? Majority which way? Republican or Democrat? The gender gap is is full on. The gender gap is seven points in 2008, it's 10 points in 2012, it's 11 points in 2016. So it's a big gender gap, which is to say women, more women are voting Democratic compared to men. Where are white women there? Democratic or Republican by a majority? 
They're Republican, indeed. So when you consider what are the causes of the gender gap, it's no accident that it's occurring at the time that the composition of the American public and the voting population is changing. And why is that the case? Because African American women and minorities in the United States are overwhelmingly heavily Democratic, pushing and carrying with them white women to make women overall look, look Democratic even despite the fact that in 18 of the 18 elections for president between 1952 and 2016, how many times have white women voted majority Democratic? Once. The answer's on the screen. Two. Two. So I think it's a little more complicated than that. And these don't have to be either or explanations, they're and. So everything Christina has said is correct. And yet at the same time, perhaps the most important reason why the gender gap exists and is as persistent as it is and growing over time is because African American, Latina, Asian American women have systematically different partisan identifications, turnout, and candidate choice compared to white women. So I, I do agree entirely um, with everything that uh, uh, Jean just said in that graph I was showing is her graph that I think is really powerful showing that the yellow is um, African American women voting for the Democratic Party, the uh, purple is uh, white women and the green is Latino women. And again, what you see as Jane just said is consistently white women are, less than 50% of them are voting for Democratic candidates. It is important to say that over time, what it means to vote Democratic and Republican is changing, um, partly because of civil rights realignment, et cetera. This is sort of the point we made to the first question. Both of these things are happening, right? And so um, this is 2016 data. Uh, white men, about 30% vote for the Democratic Party in 2016 compared to more than 40% of white women. So there is a gender gap. Women are more likely to vote for the Democratic, white women are more likely to vote for the Democratic candidate. It's just most of them still vote for the Republican candidate. Both of those things can be true. Yep. African American women overwhelmingly voting for the Democratic candidate. So are African American men, just less so than women, right? So there's going to be, oh, I guess I can include the other one. This is just showing that nothing changed since 2012. Um, this is where I think the complexity is exactly so important, right? The male electorate is also diversifying during this period, but that has different implications because there are these gender differences, even within race and uh, identity, uh, race and ethnicity groups. So when the gender gap appears, there starts to be the creation on cable talk shows and talk radio of a lot of these popular terms that are used, and they're gender-based. So you have uh, soccer moms you have NASCAR dads, and then in another iteration, you have security moms. Why do these terms become so popular, and are they limiting and problematic in their own ways? Given what you've just said about the complexities of race and other variables interacting with gender when it comes to predictive voting. So I'm gonna flip back to soccer moms. Here we go. Um, this is the percentage of the population since 1980 uh, that are white, married, and have children. Uh, it's a percentage of the female population. Um, so the point is, first of all, there's not very many soccer moms using a broad definition of the way it's usually been talked about. So one of the things that I try to talk about in my research is there's how women actually vote, and then there's how we understand women voters. And to the extent that you think of the vote as a tool for political influence and power, both of those things matter a lot. So women can turn out and vote in certain ways and that can influence the outcome. But if everyone thinks, boy, to really understand the women voter, you have to understand the needs of white women who live in suburbs and drive their kids around in minivans to go play soccer, you're gonna have a very constricted view of the interests and political needs of women. So first of all, soccer moms aren't very much uh, a very big part of the female electorate. They are also, this is, I'll talk about it in a second, they're not actually swing voters any more than soccer dads, or I don't have up here, but I can just show the general population. What this is showing is over time, the movement in terms of Republican vote share of soccer moms and soccer dads, and those big wide T's, those are showing, because those are small population, that there's a lot of variance there. They're not really swing voters either. But we keep talking about them. We keep talking about security moms, even though women who had children and were worried about uh, the war in 2004 did not vote any differently than anybody else did, um, et cetera. 
it's, it's who we sort of hand political power to, who we think really matters, and who politicians who want to get everyone to vote for them should be appealing to. Maybe they should be talking about other issues. Maybe they should recognize, as Jane has said so well, how diverse racial, ethnically, and in many other ways the female electorate is. So those terms that come up time and time again are problematic. The other thing I'll say quickly is they're also a throwback. So when this nation was founded, um, I just got to see the, Consti the Constitution again uh, today at the National Archives. Um, this was a puzzle. What are we going to do with women, right? We have this political society based on consent of the governed, but women can't vote. Don't be ridiculous. And the answer was Republican motherhood. It's women's jobs in a democracy to raise up good sons, to provide good guidance to their husbands. And because they're not in politics, they'll be so ethical and morally pure because they won't be dirtied by the political world. It's not clear to me that soccer moms and security moms and hockey moms and you name waitress moms aren't just another version of this sort of political momism. That in the end, women's interests are really just about their family and no other concern that they might have. Well said. Okay. Okay, so we're going to have one more question before we go to the audience. Uh, you had, you talked a little bit about 2016 and some of the, uh, the results for 2016 different um, uh, voting groups, both men and women demographic voting groups. Let's get you on the record. What do you think is going to happen in 2020? Do you think we're going to see similar patterns to what you have for 2016? Or do we have information from the 2018 midterms or this off-year election in 2019 that indicate that some of these patterns or demographics might be changing? I definitely think that's one that Jane wants to answer. <laughs> uh, well, remember that the voting population is a dynamic entity. It can, changes every time, not only with, we, we call it uh, population replacement, it just means some voters are leaving um, and other voters are entering. Most of the time we think about that around age, and that's certainly part of it. We think about what are the young voters going to do, all those young cool people, they're going to do something different. But we also have to keep in mind that the population of voters, any given cross-sectional election has a different population in it precisely because of the either success of mobilization or the success of voter suppression or the people just decide to, to stay home. So every election we look at, we have to think about not only the perceptions of voters and their candidate choices and their partisan identifications, but whether or not they're going to come out. Having said that, I think the most, so keep that in mind, because turnout and mobilization, so those are, turnout and mobilization are critical, as is candidate vote choice. But let's just concentrate for a moment then or thinking, what can we learn from the midterm elections? So it depends on uh, which side you're sitting on. Um, as scholars, we sit squarely in the middle and we try to look at the data for what the data tell us. And I'll just give you a couple of things to think about as you consider maybe things have changed since 2016. Maybe, like you might say, who is it that wins elections for, for people? Well, it's everybody, everybody that turns out. But let's think for a moment, do you expect, um, did, oh, well, let me just ask you this in the first place, did it surprise you knowing what you knew about the gender gap in 2016 that Donald Trump received 52% of uh, white women's votes? Who was surprised by that? I was surprised by that. I'm supposed to specialize in this. But I was surprised by that in the sense that we are kind of brought into this idea that a woman maybe would have a harder time voting for, for a candidate that was, had been documented to have um, some potent, some issues with uh, female voters. And so, but it well happened. Said. But it happened. And um, people, a lot of people have asked me since then to explain that. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of other examples. So that probably, in my view, isn't going to change a whole lot. And I'll tell you why I think that. Um, I think there may be some change around the margins. But this is a pattern that has persisted for a very long time. We may, in the question and answer, ask why Why do uh, women support either one party or the other. But I'll just give you just some, some stuff to think about, not only in the 2018 midterms. It's a very different situation because those are district level elections. But let me give you the example of the special election for the United States Senate in Alabama. Do you remember that one? Who was running in that? Doug Jones, who was the sitting senator, now they were running to fill um, Jeff Sessions' seat when he was appointed attorney general. And it was Roy Moore, 
who was the Republican, what was what what did he become kind of famous for? Um, well, what was he accused of? So he was accused of some um, sexual misconduct um, with um, minors, minor children, girls, and he was running against the Democrat um, Doug Jones. In that in that election, Doug Jones won by a very small margin. But where did white women go in that election? Do you, does anybody know? Did they support Roy Moore, the Republican, or Doug Jones, the Democrat? They supported Moore by a margin of 63 to 34 um, percent. White college-educated women in the state of Alabama supported Roy Moore 52 percent to 45. So that that only you, you could argue that this maybe is inconsistent with. Um, uh, white womanhood or being a mother, but nevertheless, those are the facts, as they say. Um, let me also give you an example from last year. And this isn't a voting example, but this is, um, it was about a year ago, about a, a little more than a year ago, you all remember the confirmation hearings of um, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and that uh, famous day where they had two sets of testimony, one in the morning with Christine Blasey Ford, and one in the afternoon with uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Quinnipiac University did a, did a poll and it asked people whether or not they thought the Senate should confirm Brett Kavanaugh. And of course you saw the distinction between Republicans and Democrats clearly. So Republicans, 84% of them said yes, we should confirm. 88% of Democrats said no. What did women, was there a gender gap do you think? Seeing Christine Blasey Ford and then Brett Kavanaugh? There was a big gender gap. It was a, it was a fairly large gender gap. And in particular, and as pointed out by the press, um, there was a big gap between whites with college and without college. So you, in this case, whites with a college degree um, said no. They did not think by a majority, by 7%. But whites without a college degree, 59% supported. But overall, where did white female voters fall on confirming Brett Kavanaugh? Did you think they supported confirming Brett Kavanaugh or they opposed how many of you say that they supported it by a majority? How many say they opposed it? They were pretty dead even. So both of you are right. <laughs> All of you are right. So basically what happened is white female respondents in answer to the question of whether or not Brett Kavanaugh should be confirmed was were evenly split, 45 to 46%. So what I'm saying is that I think that it's, it's unlikely that these are going to change, that these essential, the loyalties of, of uh, women and men to the parties are going to change. At issue will be who's in the middle, who's undecided. It's always the case that it's who's undecided. And it also depends on how it is that parties and organizations mobilize people to come to the ballot box or turn their ballots in. So I think it's going to be close. Great. I know we must have a lot of questions from the audience, and we do have microphones that will be around. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Let's see. Yes, right here we have a question. Thank you. Thank all of you for your incredible expertise. Um, I, since since the, uh, the 1960s, have there been any studies on Asian American voters because we were yes um, and I'm just wondering why that may or may not be included in mm. what you're presenting today thank you Your data. my data comes from the easiest source I had available to which is the Amer American National Election Study that has not normally done a very good job at sampling that population so the answer is there are great studies that have been done on exactly that question it's not represented in that um, in that figure and what do those great studies say? Well, I mean, Asian American voters are a relatively small part of the American population of voters, about 4%, 5%. In the state of California, however, 14% of the population of voters is Asian American. It's double the size of the African American population, which is pretty shocking. But not so if you've, if lately, if you've been to San Francisco or Los Angeles or anywhere in between, you'll, it won't look, you, it, it, the, this crowd looks quite different from what we would see in Los Angeles or San Francisco. And in most cases, are you interested in partisan identification? Is that what you're interested in and where people are voting? Yeah. Thank you. And if, yes, and if the trends 
to your knowledge, are at all similar to what's uh, happening with other communities of color and how they vote they, and they the look gender gap they're in? Yes, they look very similar. So in other words, they look, uh, Asian Americans vote much more Democratic than Republican. It depends on the type of Asian American voter. And in particular, as with Latino voters, you'll see, uh, give me an example of who votes Republican among Latinos, who might you suspect? Cubans, exactly. And uh, among um, Asian Americans, the same is, is true. There are, in particular, long-standing studies of Vietnamese Americans in the United States who have an anti-communist viewpoint having come to the United States as refugee populations, as Cubans did as well. But overall, Asian Americans are becoming much more heavily democratic over time. We have a number of studies. I did one of those, the first uh, National Survey of Asian Americans in 2008. It took that long to get one. And we've had studies since then. It's, if, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to do national surveys of Asian Americans, not only because they're a relatively sparse population, concentrated in certain locations, but you can imagine the language barriers to doing so. About 80% of Asian American adults in the United States today are born outside of the United States and therefore may enter with, usually will enter with a language other than English. So we did our survey in seven languages. It was a, it was a monster to do, to translate and then to do the survey in that many languages, even of voters. Voters like to, most people would like to talk to you in their original language or the one that they're most comfortable with. And what we did find though and what you continue to find is movement, uh, much more heavy movement toward the Democratic Party. They look a lot like Latinos in uh, Christina's data here. They look like Latinos. They're not as Democratic as African Americans, but they're much more Democratic than whites. And they're about as Democratic as uh, Latino voters. It's very similar in many ways to Latino voters with the exception being higher on average socioeconomic status and educational attainment. Okay. Other questions? Back here. Mm -hmm. So thank you both for your um, really great information. I had a question about how, if you've looked at how women as new voters versus how immigrants as new voters, like what is the kind of trend? Was it a similar adoption rate or I guess an enfranchisement rate and are there any patterns there that are comparable? So that is a really terrific question. Um, in some ways, of course, there's similarity, right? There's groups that have not had the right to vote before and then do. But there's also really important differences between the two, right? So most, uh, <laughs> On average, immigrant communities are going to be much more likely to have language barriers, cultural barriers, et cetera, that obviously some of those immigrants are also women, but that did not you know, um, characterize uh, many of the women who were uh, first enfranchised in 1920. A better comparison um, might be the extension of voting rights to 18-year-olds in the late 60s, right? A group that grew up in this country, knew its, knew its traditions and issues, but had to sort of accommodate this new right. Even there, um, you know, turns out um, young people turn out at pretty low rates, um, and that was certainly true. Women also turned out at low rates, but probably the reasons for those things are, are sort of different, right? And so um, distinguishing between being denied the right to vote, which denies you the hap getting into the habit of voting, the experience, et cetera, and being subject to either rules or norms that discourage you from engaging in that sort of political activity. Um, obviously, the by far the most uh, extreme case of this is you know, the treatment of, of people of color in the South um, in the first part of the 20th century. But even women have lots of dynamics within their own families. There are stories of the few studies that were done going door to door, um, getting women to ask political questions when their husbands would basically say, oh, but this is about politics, then you talk to me, right? Becomes sort of a, a different challenge. So I think my long answer is, there's not much that can compare those two directly, and there are some challenges to making that a reasonable comparison. Other questions? Oh, way in the back. This is not something you discuss, but I wondered if any studies have been done about whether people were not willing to vote for the Democratic candidate in 2016 because of her gender. The question is about, yeah, 2016, and did people not vote for Hillary Clinton because she was a woman? Um, I think it would be, when it's, a, it's, a, it's a low social desirability place to be. 
even if you're in a Hooters, it's still a low social desirability <laughs> thing to say, I won't vote for a woman. So I think that that's hard to get good data on that. Um, I think that it's useful to just recognize that the patterns are very similar between, uh, in, by, by group, whether it's white males or, or African American women, the patterns are very similar from year to year. And so the Democratic candidate in, I mean the margin was in fact, if you look at the, the actual turnout vote or rather the popular vote, margins are not that different for Hillary Clinton than they were for Barack Obama. So um, we don't have good evidence of that and mainly because people won't tell you that. In the same way they won't say to you directly, I'm not gonna vote for that black person on the ballot. It's an, a socially undesirable thing to uh, admit to in an interview. So I would agree with that. Um, there's almost no evidence um, across other kinds of elections that women are more likely to vote for women candidates. Um, that just doesn't work that way. Um, people see their identities and their connections to candidates in, in different sorts of ways. Um, it's, we should keep in mind that it's, if, if people are gonna not wanna vote for women, that doesn't mean we should only expect that behavior of men. That's certainly entirely something women voters might say as well. As Jane just rightfully said, they're probably not gonna say that out loud, but we might think that the way that they view candidates and understand them and think about them is gonna be very different. I do wanna reiterate what Jane said and what, so this is showing the same data for 2012, uh, the second time Obama ran for reelection in 2016. There's not a lot of movement here. Um, there are gender gaps every year. There are some changes among some populations, but really, I, the way I say it to my own students is the 2016 election was totally different in 50 different ways, but it wasn't really that unusual on election day. Question right here, then we'll go over here. Did you look at any of your data um, for women who identify as LGBTQ? We don't have that in most studies, but my guess is that women who identify with a group that is marginalized and oppressed will more likely be to go with the party that supports LGBTQ rights. And my guess is that they're heavily democratic. For the limited studies that we do have in this movie in California, we have some studies um, funded or rather uh, commissioned by LGBTQ rights groups, heavily democratic. Question over here, right here. You mentioned how um, after women got, or after the 19th Amendment took a while, so some women it was difficult to socialize into the idea that you could be a voter. And I'm curious, what did, were there efforts to, you know, to register women and to encourage them to vote? And if so, what were they like in comparison to the voter registration efforts we have today or we might have seen in the 60s after a lot of after the Voting right, Rights Act. So I'm so glad you asked that because there's so many fun stories. Um, so yes, there were. Um, how widespread they were and how effective they were was going to vary. So let me just tell, just give some examples first uh, and then talk. Um, now I'm sad I didn't bring every slide I've ever made because I could show you pictures. Um, <laughs> but then talk about maybe the possible impacts. It, it might have actually, the di difference in that is, is going to be politically consequential for women. So, as you probably know, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, three months before the ratification, or several months before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, transformed themselves into the League of Women Voters for that very purpose. So the League is also celebrating their 100th anniversary right. in 2020, and there'll be lots of events um, around that as well. Um, they, as well as political parties, some local civics groups, et cetera, did all sorts of things. So there were booths at, at state fairs where you could go in and practice voting, right? The idea was women had never actually, didn't know how to pull a lever, didn't know how to you know, punch a machine, whatever it was. Newspapers ran stories in their sort of women's section of the newspaper, preparing women how to vote. Um, some of these were sort of tongue in cheek. So one of my favorite headlines is women, you can't, um, there's no mirror inside the voting booth. You can't, you, your husband cannot bribe you how to vote. Um, you know, all these sorts of ideas that, that silly women. Um, it's worth saying that there was a concern in some states, lots of articles about the fact that uh, apparently, according to these articles, women feared that in order to register to vote, they'd have to tell their age and that this would be a great tragedy um, as well, uh, to have to say this publicly. Um, 
there were, uh, I have pictures of store windows, so like the local Macy's would do itself over with like a voting demonstration about how a voting booth worked and how to vote in that state, those sorts of things. And certainly the league did lots of those sorts of activities as well. One of the things that the political scientist Anna Harvey has pointed out is that um, both political parties definitely reached out to mobilize men and women. They formed committees, they held teas, they did special speaking events just for, men, for women, et cetera. But men's organizations, for fraternal societies, labor unions, et cetera, they had a long tradition of mobilizing men voters and they were able to sort of continue to sort of mobilize men in that way. Most women's organizations did not have that history, did not have that structure or that experience. And so most of them took quite a while to even think about maybe one of the things they want to do is mobilize women. And Harvey has argued that that's actually one of the reasons that women were initially, actually despite the belief that women be flighty and you couldn't depend upon them, they were more loyal partisan voters in the 1920s than were men. And her argument is basically, Men were mobilized by parties, but also by their union and by their fraternal organization and by their professional organization. Women were really only mobilized by parties, that there really weren't as many of these other groups. And the League of Women Voters has been, since day one, expressly nonpartisan. Um, and so that might have had some political consequences for women in getting their interests represented. OK, time for one more. OK, we'll go to Jen. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such an education, and you guys are all fabulous, so thank you for doing this um, and for the research. So my question is, um, one of the takeaways that I might uh, say from, the, from your presentation is that this thing that we call the gender gap is really more about race than it is about gender. Um, yes. So why do we still call it a gender gap? It's still a gender gap, though. It is, still is because, as Christina was pointing out, even among within each group. So white women are still more democratic than white men. Uh, African American, it's right there on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not huge, but it's there and the difference, so it's still there. It's still the case that um, within each racial and ethnic group, women are still more democratic. And I, I want to also remind you that despite, or rather let you know that despite this being the case that white women are more um, Republican than they are Democratic. White women are still the biggest piece of the, de the pie of the Democratic coalition. So if you look, if you just made a pie chart, I made one, but um, if you just made a pie chart and you put all of the voters for Barack Obama in 2012 and Hillary Clinton in 2016, the very biggest piece of the pie of it is women who are white. So white women are still the stalwart. They, they may, they're not the stalwart in the sense that they don't consistently vote for and by a majority vote for Democrats, but because there's so many white women in the electorate, I think they make up 37% of the electorate in 2016, they are still the, mo the biggest piece of the pie. So the Democratic Party cannot win without white women, nor can the Republican Party. So if you are looking to swing a voter, you're gonna look for white women. The only thing I'll say in defense of the gender gap is I do like it better than asking about the woman voter, right? Which is, what does that even mean, right? And while it's often lost, at least the word gender has in it the idea that, you know, gender actually characterizes both women and men, turns out to be the way that this works. And so I think we want to ask, you know, why do men vote more Republican than women do? The same that I think instead of just asking, my gosh, why do African-American and Latino voters vote so much for the Democratic Party? I think we want to ask ourselves also, why do white men and men vote so heavily for the Republican Party? And what role does race play in both of those things? Um, and so I, I think um, if I could beg for it, the lesson would be that both of those things matter a great deal and that we really can't understand either without being attentive to that complexity. It's hard to do that. It's hard to account for more than one thing at a time. But in the absence, I mean, the, the, I would say one of the largest kind of talking points that came out of after 2016 journalists and political commentators struggled to explain why this had happened. And you remember the old, um, or the, the more recent working class whites or, or white working class. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all part of it too. So gender, race, class, again, inequalities, unholy trinity, all those come back 
and give us predictable redundancies in outcomes. When you have a two-party system where one represents one side of these traits and another might represent another, it is a predictable redundancy what you will see. The final thing that I'd like to say is about gender. It's not just women, women and men. Gender is on a continuum. It's not just men and just women. There's purple, there's green, there's yellow. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in between. When and until we can relax even more assumptions to think about what does sex and gender even mean, we're going to be in a much better place analytically once we do that. Please join me in thanking Christina Woolbrecht and Jane Johnson.